some opening words from Thomas Moore's book, The Reenchantment of Everyday Life. We are all politicians to some degree. We all live in community, and we all participate in the community's life. If our politics is ever to become re-enchanted, we all have to discover the holy, sacred, and spiritual dimensions of community life. When we give away the power to shape our communities to certain individuals we call politicians, and ourselves enjoy a life of vicarious politics, then we are contributing to the disenchantment of the world. Politics can work at a deep level only when all the people are engaged in its spirit and live fully aware that they are community beings. And so now we move into a reading to set up our minister, Reverend Brian Kiley's sermon. This reading comes from Eduardo Mendleta. He's professor of philosophy and acting director of the Rock Ethics Institute and affiliate professor in the School of International Affairs at Pennsylvania State University. And he has some words about civility, which I think is very relevant for the politics of today. Much needed. Professor Mendlata says these things. Exceptions prove the rule. Extremes reveal what is indispensable. The phenomenon Trump is both an exception and an extreme. His brand of politics proves and reveals just how important democratic civility is to a vibrant democracy. Trump, the candidate, modeled and sanctioned the kind of uncivil discourse and behavior that has not been acceptable since the 19th century, in which candidates would call each other atheists, murderers, pimps, and all kind of character assassination epitaphs. In the case of then Vice President Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, they went so far as to duel unto death. It is one thing, however, to insult an opponent. It is another to gratuitously demean innocent bystanders. What Trump has excelled at and what makes him fall outside the mainstream of U.S. political discourse and culture is his cruelty. As political theorist Judith Schlar famously claimed in her book Ordinary Vices, cruelty is the supreme evil of civil democracies a moral and political failure that must be avoided at all costs. That Schlar thought cruelty the worst thing that a Democrat can do underlines one of the essential dimensions of democratic civility in which we acknowledge each other's equality and liberty. It was the translation into French of Erasmus of Rotterdam's 1530 book on good manners for boys that popularized the word civility. In this book and in similar texts aimed at the general civic education of Christians at the time, Erasmus linked civil and moral virtues. Good manners are a sign of moral excellence. For Erasmus, civilité is not simply a mask, a way of comporting oneself in polite society, but a way of relating to oneself. How we treat others reveals how we treat ourselves morally inasmuch as we treat others as moral equals. To have good manners, then, is a sign of one's membership in a community of mutual regard and mutual respect. What sometimes gets lost in the translations, but which is nonetheless buried deep in the semantic layers of the word civitas, is that this virtue of mutual regard is directed at strangers. In the polis, or city, strangers gather as equals, Civility, in other words, is an ethics of respect for strangers. It therefore follows that how you treat strangers is the measure of your moral excellence. Those again are the words of Eduardo Mendleta. Thank you very much, John, for your leading. I gave you that reading because I knew you'd enjoy, you know, quoting another fellow Dutchman, Erasmus of Rotterdam. So. Good morning, everyone. Unitarian Universalism boasts seven principles that guide us. And the fourth of them affirms and promotes the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. 
So as we continue our examination of democracy, we begin by noting that a key aspect of our religion is democracy. But it is important to remember that this is but one of seven principles woven together. And collectively, they are meant to help us work through the challenges of living responsibly and as people with integrity. Without the balancing effect of the other six principles, democracy fails. It cannot exist without affirming the inherent worth and dignity of all people, not just the ones in our church or our city or our political party. It cannot exist if not underpinned by justice, equity, and compassion. It cannot succeed without personal freedom of belief and action. And it's doomed to fail if there's not a larger vision that encompasses peace and justice for all citizens and creatures of the planet. As the Catholic writer Stephen Schneck observed in the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies Journal, love that title, democracy requires from its citizens special virtues without which it fails. Foremost, democracy needs citizens virtuous enough to transcend self-interest in pursuit of what is good for the country as a whole. For traditional Catholic thought, that good of the whole is called the common good. In this sense, democracy depends on citizens in possession of civic virtue that directs them to the common good. If I have a criticism of Western democracy, and of course I have, but if I have a criticism of it in the 21st century, it is that this idea of the common good has eroded, if not substantially died, in the face of partisan politics. In federal, provincial, and state governments, the common good is now defined as my good, or at best, our group's good. Instead of being virtuous citizens stepping up to serve the wider community, politicians are now pretty much forced to be professional campaigners whose first job is to seek re-election and whose first loyalty is to the party that supports them. Ideologies that defend the party have for many become more important than the ideas that build communities. I'm not so cynical to say that the needs of the constituents don't figure in the motivation of their decision-making of all politicians. There are good people seeking office. I am cynical enough to think that constituent issues might not always be the deciding factor when the time comes to vote. Now, civic government might be an exception to this, but I'll come back to that. In our reading, Eduardo Mandlata spoke of civility in the public sphere. Civility, in other words, is an ethics of respect for strangers. It therefore follows that how you treat strangers is the measure of your moral excellence. Interesting thought. Well, there seems to be a distinct lack of moral excellence in politics these days. In the increasing polarization of partisan politics, the gentle and defenseless virtue of civility has become the first casualty. It is unfortunate that in both Canada and the United States, winning majority government seems to me we now have the mandate to do it our way. Our one vote cast on polling day is license for them to push a complete agenda, much of which was never discussed during the election campaign. They don't seem capable of understanding that we are complex beings. We might be, oh, say, fiscal conservatives and social liberals, or social conservatives and fiscal liberals. One vote does not grant a blanket blessing on their ideologies. And since very few politicians are ever elected with 50% of the support of people who are of voting age, their talk of the people have spoken or we have been given a mandate is puffery. As far as governments are concerned, the voice of the citizenry pretty much ended when they marked their X, at least until the next election begins to loom. And frankly, we citizens are not all that good at holding them to account. 
Still, because another election is somewhere down the road, politicos always do have an eye on image. They want their names out there and they want their names recognized, so they become more focused on image than substance. With the introduction of CPAC and C-SPAN and other legislative TV channels, thoughtful political debate has been converted to media moments. Complex policy discussions have been reduced to one-line sound bites, opened, uh, often designed to demean opponents rather than advance debate. Question period has become less an opportunity for challenging government and more a game of gotcha caught live and in color. You know, I've privately often promised myself, you may have heard me say this, some of you, that I would vote for any politician, regardless of party, if I could only once hear them proclaim of their opponent, hey, she's got a good idea, let's do that. So far, it's never been tested. Even when they vote in support of one of those measures, they won't typically give credit to anyone else, but will say, this is what we were asking for all along, what we, our party, was asking for. The lack of civility between political opponents in their public discussions is disheartening at best and a cause of despair at worst. The legendary Green Bay football coach Vince Lombardi once famously said, winning isn't the most important thing, it's the only thing. Should that really be true in democratic politics? It shouldn't, but I fear too often it is. Ideologies triumph over ideas, and that just seems wrong. I came across a basic American high school textbook, Magruder's American Government. What a great title. It defines five core principles of democracy, and they're going to sound familiar. First, recognition of the fundamental worth and dignity of every person. Second, respect for the equality of all persons. Third, faith in majority rule and an insistence upon minority rights. Fourth, acceptance of the necessity of compromise. And finally, fifth, insistence on the widest possible degree of individual freedom. Now, anyone who follows the circus in the United States, and it's hard to avoid it, might well agree that presently the American democracy is failing on all five points, despite Leonard Cohen's optimism 25 years ago. Freedoms, except when it comes to having guns, of course, are being curtailed. Minority rights ignored, and protesters like football players taking the knee during the national anthem are publicly shamed. The president himself routinely demeans the character and person of anyone who opposes him. On the matter of necessity of compromise, Magruder's text explains, compromise is, is an essential part of the democratic concept for two major reasons. First, remember that democracy puts the individual first and at the same time insists that each individual is equal to all others. In a democratic society made up of many individuals and groups with many different opinions and interests, how can the people make public decisions except by compromise? Compromise is a process, a way of achieving majority agreement. It is never an end in itself. Not all compromises are good, nor are they always necessary. In the last decade or so, there's been a rush to partisanship and winner-take-all politics in the United States that indeed harkens back to the 19th century. And it's sadly been creeping a little bit north of the border as well. During the Obama administration, the Republican Party openly declared that their mission was to thwart any legislation coming from the president and the Democrats. I am speechless. Okay, I'm not. I was. Suddenly, compromise joins civility on the scrap heap of political principle. And since the election of the 45th president of the USA, Democrats voting as a block to impede Republican repeal of things like, oh, health care, have been branded as obstructionist, 
and their own GOP senators who voted with the Democrats and on behalf of their constituents' health care, you know, doing what they were actually elected to do, they have been demeaned and branded as traitors, not just to the party, but to the country. And now we frequently see attempts at government by presidential fiat. The U.S. is slipping towards authoritarian autocracy, and that is frightening me. Democracy is in danger in the face of unrestrained partisanship and ideological ideology run rampant. Now, Canada seems to be managing better. Perhaps it's because our PM and premiers are always aware that they can do little without the support of their caucus members. And the caucus members are closer to the people. We generally have smaller ridings than in the U.S. We saw an amazing thing this week when the federal government rewrote proposed tax legislation because enough people spoke out against the perceived flaws of their law. It was a week when ideas triumphed over ideologies for once. Our democracy may be bruised, but it's not yet broken in my view. Values still seem to matter, at least a little bit. And as long as some kind of moral imperative guides our leaders, we have a hope that the principles of democracy will still hold their place. So how do we rebuild or restore democracy? Well, first, I think we have to rethink our system. Two weeks ago, I described the new rise of cities and how they are the major deliverers of service to the population, no matter who's actually funding the service. As a former Toronto mayor put it, mayors and council have to be activists because they're the ones who are expected to do things, to build roads, to build transit, to build libraries and community amenities. This expectation to actually do stuff marks city politicians as structurally different from their provincial, state, and federal counterparts. In order to get things done, they have to compromise. They have to negotiate, and they have to discuss the ideas that are going to be the best for the whole city. Consider the geography of legislative spaces. In Parliament, the government faces the opposition across a floor traditionally separated by two sword lengths to prevent bloodshed. The very nature of parliament is oppositional, argumentative, and aggressive. Now consider now the mayoral council, the municipal council chamber. They vary slightly from place to place, but they all have the same essential setup. The mayor and the councillors sit on the same side of a long curving table, arranged so that they can see one another, but across from them are the clerks and the administrators who support them, and behind them is us. Not stuck up in a gallery, but on the same floor. And at certain times within the municipal council, the people get to go up to the podium and address council directly. The geography seems to say that the council is meant to get along, to literally physically be on the same side, not on every issue, but on the side of the city. In all but a handful of cities in Canada, people run as independents, not as members of a political party. doesn't mean there aren't alliances that happen or shared philosophies, but they're not party members bound by that kind of rule. After last week's elections, I was coming home from Calgary, and I stopped for lunch and read the regional newspaper from Red Deer. And they covered all the tiny little town councils, as well as the Red Deer Council, as well as Edmonton and Calgary. And in virtually every article where an elected mayor was quoted, the first thing they were saying was how much they were looking forward to sitting down with the new councillors and finding out how they could work together. That's different. Let's do lunch and figure out how we're going to get along and get things done. Because our job is to get things done. Little gets done at the municipal level without meaningful discussion and compromise. Councillors perceived as continually obstructionist tend to not get re-elected. 
We need to rethink the usefulness of party politics and, if not dispense with parties, at least consider ways to push them back to ideas and de-emphasize ideologies. So what can we do? Well, we not only have a say in all of this, but a role to play. I quoted Stephen Schneck earlier. Foremost, democracy needs citizens virtuous enough to transcend self-interest in pursuit of what is good for the republic as a whole. We have to be those citizens. We have to model an understanding of the common good to one another and show it to our political leaders. We have to put our own self-interest to the side sometimes and look at issues under discussion on their merit. Our city has a goal of creating 10% of affordable or so social housing in every geographic region of the city. And in some quarters, this plan has sparked bitter NIMBY backlash based on assertions about crime and danger that are easily proven to be untrue. I know this because for the last eight years I worked with the Interfaith Housing Initiative along with Audrey Brooks and I've had a hand in designing workshops that talk to communities and community leagues about this and surfaces some of these falsehoods and tries to talk to people before the issue gets too hot and somebody wants to build a building. We've had good success having those conversations and in those neighborhoods there tends to be a lower NIMBY reaction. Now, sure, our self-interest matters, but if we are to support the common good, we also need to look at the issues from all sides before we make a decision. To listen, as well as to speak. And if we don't adopt a belief in the common good as a virtue, how can we ever expect our elected representatives to do the same? We must demand civility and responsibility from them. And the best way to do that is to show by our actions that it matters to us. If they won't consult with us, we must start the consultation with letters and calls and visits, with peaceful protests and petitions. And we must show them what can be done in a civil and morally responsible way. Our government will reflect our values. If we won't embrace and promote civility and the basic principles of democracy, then we are fools to think they will. Come in. The poet Marge Piercy writes, We must sit down and reason together. Perhaps we should sit in the dark. In the dark, we could utter our feelings. In the dark, we could propose and describe and suggest. In the dark, we could not see who speaks, and only the words would say what they say. No one would speak more than twice. No one would speak less than once. Thus saying what we feel and what we want, what we fear for ourselves and each other, into the dark. Perhaps we could begin to begin to listen. The woman must learn to dare to speak. The men must learn to bother to listen. The women must learn to say, I think this is so. The men must learn to stop dancing solos on the ceiling. After each speaks, she or he will say a ritual phrase. It is not I who speaks, but the wind. Wind blows through me, long after me is the wind.